Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Hey, good morning everyone, thanks for coming. I'm uh, Adam Johnson, I'm from uh, Midokura and the uh, Midonet project. And uh, today we're gonna talk about uh, Midonet, go through a 101 uh, and cover the, the architecture. If we have time, I'll attempt a demo as well. Um, so before we get started, I'm just curious how many of you have actually tried Midonet so far? Just raise your hand, all right. A decent number, great. Um, and uh, I'll kind of go over how you can actually get started uh, and try Midonet if you haven't, if you're interested. Um, you can see the agenda there. I won't go through it because uh, I'll start with uh, this. So first of all, you know, why do we need, why do we need Midonet or net virtual networks in general? Um, you know, it, this is pretty basic stuff, but, you know, basically there are requirements, you know, uh, infrastructure as a service, especially OpenStack has requirements like multi-tenancy, um, more agility on the networking side. OpenStack in general has allowed, you know, people to spin up uh, VMs and storage in a matter of seconds or minutes, uh, but a lot of the um, people running in production still have kind of very crude networking uh, that requires manual intervention whenever you need to make network changes. So you're either forced into very, very simple networking models uh, where you don't have advanced networking services or uh, your provisioning time is just very slow. You know, we talked to several people who run um, these environments in production with, uh, you know, very basic networking models and, you know, their provisioning times are lengthened by two to ten times uh, just because of networking changes that have to occur in production. Um, so moving networking into software certainly can fix that just as it has for storage and compute. Um, so that's what this is all about, um, is just making things faster, making it more scalable, um, and multi-tenant, of course. So before I get into how MediaNet works, um, this is kind of a slew of features that MediaNet covers today. Um, it's, I'm probably missing some stuff, but in general, um, we're doing layer two through four services and some other services around Neutron. So our, our goal was to um, essentially provide all of the networking services that Neutron needs in a fully distributed system. So to do that, we've embedded all of these services into MediaNet itself. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's very cool. So, so essentially we've, as of the latest version that's, that's in RC right now, we've, uh, we actually have pretty much everything. You don't have to run any of the Python agents of Neutron anymore. Um, and you just run a single MediaNet agent on every compute host. So, uh, you know, the last pieces we had to do were basically distributed metadata. So even metadata, DHCP, um, and then all the normal networking stuff like layer two, layer three switching and distributed routing, um, firewall, like security groups, NAT, everything is covered um, in, in MediaNet. Um, there are some other advanced um, kind of use cases that we also cover. Um, you may have heard of Courier. It uh, was covered in the keynote and a few other sessions this week. Um, so we've uh, been contributing to that project uh, with, the, with the intent of connecting MediaNet into uh, Docker and, and other you know, related projects as well. Um, we also can connect into physical uh, networks uh, using VTAP. Uh, I'll cover that briefly. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the, the main one we're talking about today is uh, OpenStack and Neutron integration. So just a little bit of a background on Midonet. Uh, Midonet started from Midokura, the company. Uh, we actually started Midokura back in 2010. Uh, we started here in Tokyo. Um, and uh, it was uh, originally a proprietary project. Our original version of Midonet, uh, we called Midoman. It's kind of a Japanese play on words. <laughs> and uh, it was written in Python. Um, we hacked it up really quickly. Um, it was uh, um, essentially connecting to Open vSwitch in user land, um, and we had some extensions, uh, and then you know, it was providing basically layer three on layer three uh, with encapsulation using GRE. Um, we decided to rewrite it quite some time ago into Java uh, for the 1.0 release, um, and the reason we did that was mainly because we were, um, as we were adding a lot more functionality and doing a lot more distributed stuff, it was you know, becoming very difficult to um, maintain quality and uh, there was just a lack of, uh, of tooling um, that we needed for kind of distributed debugging and things like this. Um, so we decided to rewrite in Java, and very quickly after that, we started introducing Scala. Uh, I think most of the code now is, is in Scala. If you go to our GitHub page, 
Um, it says we're a Scala project. Um, we actually open sourced MediaNet uh, back in November 2014 in the Paris OpenStack Summit. Um, so it's been almost a year now. Um, we decided to open source MediaNet because um, you know, we were just seeing uh, demand from the market uh, for an open source solution. We saw a lot of fragmentation in Neutron with a lot of different proprietary plugins. There's like 20 some plugins in Neutron uh, doing various things. Um, and it felt like you know, there was just a need for this to you know, try to get people to avoid you know, reinventing the wheel and just provide something that uh, people can use whether they want to pay for it or not. Um, so they, you know, uh, just to kind of solve a lot of the problems that uh, we were seeing around the OBS project um, for production workloads. And uh, also get into a little bit of MediaNet 5.0, um, and, and actually a lot of the architecture is, that I'll talk about is based on the 5.0. Uh, we actually jumped from 1.9 to 5.0 because of the OpenStack versioning changes. So this is actually our fifth release, um, so we decided to kind of match uh, versioning schemes that way as well. So that's why there's a weird jump. <coughs> so uh, you can go to MediaNet.org. There's a lot of information on there. That's the, the home page of the community. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about the community a little bit later as well. So getting into the architecture. So uh, MediaNet's architecture is fairly straightforward and simple. Um, this is a, like the 10,000 foot view here. And, and I'll zoom in to get um, far greater detail in the next slide. But I just wanted to show you the, the concept of a virtual network uh, with overlays. So if you see the bottom of this diagram, this is the physical infrastructure. Um, and it is very simple. On the left-hand side, where it says internet, these boxes are just x86 boxes. The little MediaNet logo there denotes that this is the MediaNet agent or middleman uh, running on those boxes. It's talking to the internet using BGP multi-homing. Um, then on the bottom middle, you see this network state database. Um, this is actually just running um, some uh, minimal MediaNet software to do some uh, uh, commands like um, VTAP and things like this. And it's mainly uh, Apache Zookeeper. So this is our topology storage, which I'll get into as well. Um, so there's, there's three of these because they run in a quorum. You can run some odd number of them, uh, depending on how much you want to scale. Uh, and the point that I want to make here is that this is not a, um, a, a controller. It's not doing any computation of flows here. We do the computation of flows at the edge. So that would be on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. So the left-hand side being the gateway nodes and the right-hand side being the compute hosts where the VMs or containers are. Um, so on the right-hand side, the, the MediaNet uh, agent is also installed on those. That's the same agent that runs on the gateway nodes. And then on the top, you can see the logical topology. Um, so in the logical topology, it's very familiar to Neutron. Um, those concepts pretty much map identically. Um, the only one that might not map, well, in this, in this diagram, it doesn't show it. Uh, we have a provider router, um, which, which is proposed in Neutron. Um, and I'll talk about that later. So kind of zooming in a little more. Um, you can see more details of, of the components here. So really the only components of MediaNet uh, in an install are the MediaNet agent, or MediaMan, the network state database, which is Zookeeper, uh, and we have some cluster uh, uh, things in, in 5.0, uh, which we're introducing, and then the MediaNet plugin in Neutron, and we have MediaNet API and MediaNet CLI. Um, these are just talking to the network state database. So that's pretty much it. There's not, much, there's not much to it. It's very straightforward. It's very simple. There's very few moving pieces. Um, but this uh, basically allows you to have a fully distributed network. So zooming into the compute hosts, uh, on the compute hosts we have the MediaNet agent, which is talking directly to the um, uh, Open vSwitch data path. Um, it's using a Netlink channel uh, to talk down to that. Um, so we're actually replacing the, the Open vSwitch user space agent with the MediaNet agent. Um, and the reason we did that was because we were adding a lot more um, higher layer networking functions into that. Um, so instead of you know, having another agent that talks to user space OVS, we just decided to talk directly to the kernel. It was uh, simpler for us to, to do and uh, a little bit more efficient. Um, and uh, we, you can see the VMs uh, on this host. We'll just have normal interfaces. So if you do ifconfig, you'll see a bunch of tap interfaces. MediaNet will plug into those. Um, to, to, uh, to have control of the network. And the MediaNet agent also connects down to the 
uh, network state database. You can see a little peak of that at the bottom. Uh, so this is where the MetaNet agents get all of their states. So this is getting all of the high level states um, and they'll cache that information locally as well. So you don't have to always go off box uh, to get the, the topology. Um, and you can view the MetaNet agent as kind of a network simulator. Um, so it's not like a virtual appliance or anything like this. Um, so, so when we show the logical topology, those you know, logical devices don't exist in any certain physical location. Um, they're just uh, computated uh, on a flow-by-flow -flow basis at the ingress of the network. So how do we get packets from one place to another? It's just overlays, so we're using tunneling and encapsulation. So uh, between two uh, compute hosts, if you're sending VM east-west traffic, it's going to set up a tunnel uh, between two, two uh, boxes uh, and encapsulate that. We can use VXLAN or GRE. Um, if the kernel supports other things like uh, Geneve or, or other types of uh, encapsulation formats, it's fairly easy you know, to add those into MetaNet as well. Um, and then if we're going outside uh, to the external networks like the internet, um, it would be going out these BGP gateways. We show two, but you can actually run as many as you like. Um, the MetaNet agents are, um, they don't have any hard state. Um, we're not using any namespaces uh, to, to do any of the services. Uh, so we don't have to worry about um, storing state and, and having to synchronize those uh, across each other. Uh, we do synchronize some state between each other, which I'll get into, uh, for stateful networking. Uh, but in general, uh, you could run three or five uh, gateway nodes, uh, and the return traffic is allowed to come back through any of those. Uh, and since they're just talking to the network state database for the topology, they can figure out what to do with that traffic. So the network state database um, is, is kind of the you know, very simple uh, heart of MetaNet. Uh, so we use Apache Zookeeper. Um, and the reason we use Apache Zookeeper is because it, uh, you know, it's, first of all, it's a distributed um, database, so it's, it's very easy to run. Um, and, and we're not storing a lot of data in here. It's just very high-level network topology. So this is very similar to the Neutron model. Our model differs slightly, um, but we can map the Neutron model into MetaNet um, very easily. And the other reason we use Zookeeper is because it has a watcher uh, kind of public, uh, pub sub mechanism that we take advantage of. Um, and this allows the MetaNet agents to get topology updates. So if, if you were to um, change a security group rule or do a live migrate, uh, Zookeeper knows which agents are actively processing <coughs> flows for that topology and it will send updates to those uh, agents saying, your topology has changed, you need to redo your flows. Um, so this is a really uh, essential feature of Zookeeper that we use. Um, in the, in the 5.0 version, uh, we did a lot of re-architecting to make MetaNet a lot more modular. Um, so we, we actually have abstracted out Zookeeper from, um, from the rest of MetaNet, so you could actually program into uh, what, we, what we call Zoom. So we actually uh, program protobufs, which are then conver converted into Zookeeper. So it's possible we could replace Zookeeper with some other database like uh, etcd uh, in the future. There's been some, some talk of that. Um, and then how we integrate with OpenStack. Uh, we actually have two ways to, to uh, plug into OpenStack today. Um, the, the main method right now is the monolithic plugin uh, to Neutron. So you'd install our MetaNet plugin. This is written in Python. The MetaNet plugin is, is in OpenStack project. Um, and uh, essentially, all it's doing is taking the Neutron API calls and converting them into uh, MetaNet API, API calls, which are fairly similar. Um, it's just a little bit different. Um, it's writing that into Zookeeper. Uh, and then Neutron is also writing into uh, MySQL. Um, so it's making two copies um, of that. So you can interact with MetaNet via you know, Horizon, Horizon's uh, Neutron functions, or you can use Neutron CLI, or you can use MetaNet CLI or, or our API. Um, if you, the, the thing to note is if you make changes to the neutrons, uh, so the MetaNet CLI, those are not seen in Neutron. So if you create a router in, in MetaNet through the MetaNet CLI, it will not be seen in Neutron, but it will exist. So that's, you know, most people are interacting via Neutron itself. That's the intent is user-facing API is Neutron. Uh, but if you need to do some uh, advanced uh, functions, uh, like setting up uh, dynamic routing, which is not part of Neutron, you could use the MetaNet uh, CLI or API to do that. So it's more admin, admin functions. Um, so, 
So we, we uh, have a concept of active, active gateways, which we call, sometimes we call L3 gateway or BGP gateway. Um, and, and this is very cool actually uh, because it's exactly the same software that runs on the compute host that's running on the gateway nodes. Um, those gateway nodes are connecting to some upstream physical router or switch uh, that speaks BGP. Uh, it, it is using eBGP and it's, it's essentially advertising the floating IP uh, pool that's, that you've set up. Um, so this is handling the, um, the external network. Um, all of those hosts are advertising the same pool, uh, so they're all multi-homing. And the, uh, so this allows um, the physical network for the inbound traffic to use equal cost multipath to balance across all of those gateways. And then we do the same thing going out. Um, so you have a nice um, balance of traffic there. So just kind of a quick recap of the, of the architecture. Uh, so you can see, you know, we have the compute hosts, which are identical to the gateway hosts, except we're not running VMs in there. You could, but it, it's not, uh, not ideal. Uh, we have the network state database, um, and then we have the, the API and the plugin. This is very, very straightforward. And then again, zooming back up 10,000 feet, you can now see the logical topology. Um, and you can see the, uh, the V ports on the logical top topology are you know, connected down to the physical infrastructure. So that's the only part where uh, the logical topology touches the um, physical topology. So in, in Metonet, you'll have virtual ports. You can bind those ports to uh, interfaces in Linux, in, in, in any interface. So it could be a physical NIC or it could be a TAP interface. Um, with our plugin in OpenStack, um, Libvirt is doing the VIF plugging for you automatically. Um, and for the gateway nodes, basically you just uh, bind a port on the uh, admin or provider router to the, the uh, to a to a NIC in, in the in the x86 boxes acting as the layer three gateway. So, zooming in a little bit more um, to go through some of the um, how some of these features actually work. Um, so we'll cover a few of these. So distributed L2 switching. So um, on the top of this, you see the virtual uh, virtual topology or logical topology. On the bottom left, you see the physical topology. Um, and then on the right is kind of explaining what's going on. Essentially, um, all of the state is stored in Zookeeper. We are storing um, uh, the host uh, IP to virtual Mac uh, mapping. So whenever you spin up a VM in OpenStack, we are storing the virtual Mac of the vPort. Uh, and we're, that's associated, the, the host and IP that's associated with that. This would be the tunnel IP. Um, so, so when you set up Metonet, um, when you add a physical compute host, you're adding it to a tunnel zone, uh, and you're basically saying, I want to put uh, ETH1 on, on uh, this tunnel zone, so we know which uh, physical NIC to send the traffic to for, for tunneling. Um, so since this is stored in Zookeeper, uh, when you are doing a, a, a ping, for example, from VM1 to VM2, which is on the same neutron network, uh, we don't actually have to do a physical ARP. Uh, we already know that uh, in the logical topology, so we can just assume that this, we, I mean, we already know where to go, so we just kind of fake an ARP, um, and we program the flow directly, uh, and then just send it across. So there's actually no traffic sent off the box other than the, uh, the tunnel and the, the encapsulated traffic itself. And when you do make a change to that, again, um, they're subscribing to that change in Zookeeper. Um, so if you were to do a live migrate of VM2 to another host, that mapping will update, and the, uh, the host where VM1 is living would, would get that update. Uh, so it would know to uh, make a change to the, uh, to the flows. So it would invalidate all of the flows uh, related to that, re-simulate, and add new flows. Now, if we want to connect this same neutron network or virtual switch, that's the same thing, basically, to a uh, physical hardware uh, without going through some routing, um, like, like uh, say you have a, a database that can't be virtualized, uh, so you want to connect that to a, a VLAN, uh, we can use VTAP uh, to do this hardware VTAP, so hardware layer two gateways. So there are some switches capable of um, allowing us to program them and send them this host to uh, virtual MAC IP mapping. Uh, those, these are the Broadcom Trident 2 uh, chipset switches, basically. And we're using OVSDB uh, to, to program those switches, so it's fairly standard now. Um, a lot, most of the switch manufacturers have this capability. Um, and essentially, uh, what you can do is you can create a port on the uh, virtual switch, 
that's a, that's a VXLAN uh, gateway port or VTEP port. Um, and you essentially are pointing that to a port or VLAN on a hardware switch. Um, and then Metonet, the, this is where the cluster API comes in. So um, on, the, on the Zookeeper nodes, we also are running some code, which, act, which is acting as the cluster API. This is actually doing the OVSDB calls to the switch. Um, so it will set that up. It will then also send the, um, the physical host IP to Mac uh, mapping to that switch. So when you're doing a, um, a, a ping, for example, from VM1 to some physical hardware, that tunnel will go directly to the hardware VTAP uh, and not go through uh, the, the software gateways anymore. So, so you can see, basically, with this distributed networking model, um, we can do a lot of inter interesting stuff. And as you have, um, you can have multiple, uh, these multiple, multiple layer two gateways uh, spread across the physical network, uh, going to multiple different VLANs, all with the same neutron network. Um, so logically, on the right-hand side, you see it's very simplistic. On the right-hand side, you know, it could be you know, spread across the data center, uh, all going over layer three. Um, and it, really, it's very simple. So the, the network admins don't have to do any changes to the physical uh, network as long as there's IP connectivity. So it's, it's quite nice. So going up the network stack, um, to L3 routing. Um, we have, as I said, this concept of BGP routing, uh, dynamic routing. So we, in, in Metonet, we have a concept of this provider router. Uh, so this is not something you'd find in Neutron yet. Uh, there's some blueprints that's been around for a while um, uh, trying to add this capability. But essentially, um, right above the, the tenant routers uh, in Metonet, if you look in Metonet, you'll see the tenant routers are connected to a provider router. This is done, this is done automatically when you set the external network in, in OpenStack. Um, so the provider router, you have one of these typically, although it's, it's not uh, built in. You can, you can do a lot of different uh, models, but this is very standard. Um, and this provider router will have multiple uplinks. Um, usually these uplinks are uh, separate physical boxes, so two or three physical boxes, you bind the, the V ports on this provider router to uh, physical NICs across three, three different boxes. These will then uh, peer to some switch, uh, upstream physical switch uh, using BGP, uh, and then you'll, you'll have the connect connectivity out. Um, so this is very neat. So we can also handle security groups uh, and firewalls as a service. Um, so in Neutron, you know, you're, de you're defining the security groups, you know, very straightforward. Um, and we, we actually have a slightly different model within Metonet. It's a little bit more low layer. Um, and we, but we can convert the uh, security groups automatically into what we call chains and rules. So this is very much uh, mapped after kind of uh, uh, security groups, uh, sorry, after uh, IP tables uh, in Linux. So, um, it's not exactly the same, but it's, it's very similar. So uh, this allows us to have um, you know, chains, and in a chain you have rules, and we can have uh, jump rules to jump to other chains. So it gives us a lot more control. Uh, we can do a lot more interesting things. We have access to all of the layer two through four uh, fields, uh, and we can do things like anti-spoofing rules. We can do wildcards and ranges. Um, and you can apply these uh, chains to any of the lo logical um, uh, topologies. So this could be ports, or it could be on routers, pre and post routing. You can do it on, on in and out filters on the bridges as well. So it's very flexible where you put things uh, and it can be dynamically updated or removed uh, at any time. Uh, the, the very cool thing here is that since this is also distributed, uh, it means that the, the, uh, the gateway nodes and the compute hosts are able to do this firewall function. So uh, depending on where the traffic is coming in, so if it's from the VM, it's handled locally. So the security groups will be handled locally. If it's coming from the external network, it's going to be handled by the gateway nodes. So if, you're, if you have a VM that's uh, blocking traffic from a particular source that's attacking it, um, that traffic will be blocked on the gateways uh, themselves, not on the private network. Uh, so it, it will never go through the private network. As opposed to um, if you're using OBS plugin right now, that's going to go all the way to the compute host and then run on IP tables locally and dropped. Um, still, so it still traverses the private network and affects all of the uh, VMs on that host. Um, so this, 
reduces a lot of uh, unnecessary traffic across the, uh, across the network. Um, so just to kind of see an example of what um, a security group would look like in MetaNet, um, you know, we have a chain and on this chain we have some drop rules and accept rules um, and you can also have jump rules to other security groups. Um, so this is kind of the idea. It's not really meant for users to program it, um, but if you have some advanced functionality that you want to create, it's pretty flexible. So you could, uh, you could add features to MetaNet by doing this. Uh, we can also do NAT, uh, stateful and stateless, uh, which, is, which is also very cool. So um, it's basically the same idea here. Um, MetaNet agent, since it's just simulating, it's able to do uh, essentially all of these functions. Um, and the, the tricky part about NAT for, for us was there is some state that has to be exchanged between the agents. So in our first implementation, we were using uh, Cassandra. So we were storing the stateful connection information in Cassandra um, so that the agents can both have those. And the, the main use case here is that um, the gateway nodes, since we're running act active gateway nodes, they all need to have access to all of the stateful connection tracking information uh, so the return flows you know, can, can go across any of the gateways. Um, going through Cassandra was uh, kind of problematic because it re you know, requires a ton of uh, calls off box to Cassandra. Um, this can't be cached because it's uh, updated frequently um, and it was uh, pretty poor at performance. So recently we introduced uh, um, uh, stateful uh, connection transfer between the agents so now the agents are actually doing a kind of a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communication between each other. So when you set up the gateway nodes, uh, you add those gateway nodes to a port group, uh, and that port group is basically the, the, the group that is getting sent the connection tracking information. Uh, so as a packet will come out of the VM, as a flow is set up, it will send uh, the connection tracking information out of band to the, uh, to the, to the gateway nodes, the port group, and then we can also optionally send that connection tracking information to Cassandra as a backup. So there are some edge cases where um, if you're not storing that in Cassandra, it will fail. So those would be, for example, if you restart a MetaNet agent, it's going to lose that state. Uh, so it may, not get the, it may not know what to do with it. Um, so if you're running Cassandra as a backup, if it doesn't have the state for that flow that's returning, uh, it will be able to go off box and call that from Cassandra. Uh, you, this, the other use case is for live migrate. So if live migrate happens, it's going to have to do the same thing. Um, we still, so even if you're using Cassandra, that's out of band, and it, so it doesn't actually affect the, uh, the traffic uh, or performance. So getting into the community a little bit, um, it has been about 11 months since we open sourced. Um, it's been growing steadily. Um, we have a metrics website you can, you can go to and, and see some of the stats, but we have about 77 developers, 4,800 commits, 32,000 downloads from about 1,000 1, IPs, and we have 20 supporting companies. Um, we don't have a lot of external contributors, though we, recently we have a large company who's uh, uh, putting uh, full-time developers on, on internet. So our goal is to have not a single vendor project. We really want this to be a, a community-led project. Um, so, you know, if any of you guys are interested in contributing, definitely come talk to us. Um, we have a lot of uh, infrastructure and, and uh, ways to get involved. So we have a Slack chat channel uh, that's, you know, you can always hop in there and if you have any questions or want to get involved, it's a great place to go uh, to talk to us. The mailing lists are pretty active as well. Um, we also have a lot of uh, code walkthroughs uh, on YouTube. So if you go to metonet.org, um, there's a link, Mito TV, uh, and you can find some of those walkthroughs as well. Um, and if they're, if they're kind of outdated, you can also ping us in Slack, and we, we're happy to hop on a Hangout and, and walk through some code with you guys if you're interested in contributing. And then we're, we're using the similar infrastructure as OpenStack. So we use Garrett Hub. Uh, we're using Jenkins for CI. Um, it's it's really, quite, really quite similar. So you can see some screenshots of all, the, all of these things. Uh, and docs. Um, and, and help. So, so we have a pretty good wiki. Um, we're having weekly um, meetings in Slack. Uh, the the MetaNet plugin is actually in IRC, but the, the other meetings are right now in Slack. Um, you can find the logs of those on the wiki. Um, our docs are fairly good as well, um, and we are using Jira for, for issue tracking. Um, our docs, we actually introduced Japanese uh, 
uh, language uh, documentation just recently as well. So for the, for the Japanese people in the audience, um, you know, please check it out. And if you find mistakes, you know, let us know, and we're happy to have your contributions. <laughs> so if you want to get started, it's very, uh, very straightforward. Um, we have a couple ways. Um, there's actually a lot of ways to get started, but the easiest is just to run this quick start. Um, essentially, just run this on a fresh Ubuntu 14.04 box. Um, probably 8 gigs is better if you're going to spin up VMs, because this is going to install uh, OpenStack and Metonet and configure it all for you. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes. I ran it last night. Um, it took about 20 minutes, um, but I had a good uh, connection. So the, the stable one is this, this top one. Uh, but if you want to try the latest 5.0 version, which is in kind of release candidate stage, which I did last night, it, it worked, um, you can run that as well. Um, and I'll, I'll try to get into a demo as well. I think we have some time, a uh, little, or oh, maybe a little bit. Um, so just to kind of sum up um, these things, you can read that. I'll kind of skip through, because I want to show a little bit of, uh, of uh, MetaNet. Let's see if this actually works. OK, so when you run the quick start, um, you, can, you can go to a Horizon. It's going to be set up for you. Um, the, the, we're basically uh, not setting a BGP gateway. We're just doing a static, static routes for the, you know, it's, it's just an all-in-one. So it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, but if you want to kind of see the internals of Metonet, uh, we have this uh, Metonet CLI. So you can just run Metonet CLI. So you have to log in as root, or you, or you have to you know, set up a definition file. Um, and then you can basically. Um, start checking it out. And it has tab complete, uh, so it's pretty nice. Uh, but you can say list routers, so you can see all the routers. Um, I can do things like list the routes of the routers. It's kind of hard one handed. It's router, router zero. And also, I want shoddy, uh, pretty bad Wi-Fi, but I'm using Mosh, so it should be OK. Uh, so I can list the routes like this. Um, you can also see the, um, the security groups. So if I do just uh, list chains or list chain, you can see all the chains. Um, so you can see in the, uh, it's a bunch of UUIDs, but we try to make, we, it maps to, to OpenStack UUIDs, so it's easier. Um, so OS SG. Um, and then this UUID, this is, this is the same UUID that's in Neutron. So you can uh, easily find the security group that maps to a chain uh, and, and rules in Metonet. Um, so you can see the, eg the egress and the outbound. We also have the um, anti-spoofing rules that we put on every port. Um, so you can then do a, for example, chain, chain, let's see what's an interesting one, chain three. List rules. It's slow. Oops. So you can see the rules. It's it's very low level. Um, in here as well, you can also obviously you can create rules. You can modify them, delete them. Um, and let's see if the tab complete will. Show us anything good. See, so there's all there's a bunch of stuff you can do there. You can view the tunnel zones. Uh, we also in 5.0 have some um, tech previews of uh, L2 service chaining, L2 insertion, mirroring. Um, we also have some some tra uh, troubleshooting tools like a trace virtual trace route. Um, so that we actually have a demo at 12:45 uh, to go through that. So you, I'll, I'll share that information as well. Is there any questions? So the question was, uh, if you want to use hardware offloading um, with the, for, for VXLAN, for example? Maybe VXLAN, yeah. So we do support uh, VXLAN offloading. So the, if the NIC supports VX offloading, that works fine. Um, you don't see a huge performance gain for 10 gigabit networking, but for 40, um, it's, it's recommended to do that. Yeah, we have customers running that. Um, there shouldn't be. Um, we're running a, the, 
we're running on the standard uh, tunnel ports, um, so it should it should work, but it depends on the NIC hardware. So it depends on um, if if the NIC hardware assumes a certain port, we may have to change the port or change the configuration of the the driver. Um, but it just depends. Yeah. Um, we've done testing on Emulex and Mellanox cards so far, and they seem to work pretty well. Yeah. Uh, for NSDV, do we need to set up three uh, database nodes or physical machines? Um, for for like a production, we recommend setting up three a minimum. Um, but if you uh, like this, this is uh, setting up one in the all-in one. It's just setting up one. It's not highly available, but it can run. So in a production environment, you should set up three nodes for NSDV. Yeah. So if you set up three nodes, you can handle. Um, you can handle one failure. Um, if one of those fails, you can still read, but you can't write. Um, so if you want two failures, you'd set up five. Yep. Any other questions? Yep, sorry. Um, to, this is a two-part question. Um, do you support no NAT topologies um, for the uh, open stack routers? And if you do, do you automatically advertise those networks through your VPN gateway? Um, so, so for no NAT, use cases we can support it, but it requires some manual config. So basically, um, you would just, uh, you need to add the routes. Um, so if you want to just do static static routing, you can add the routes in the meter net topology. That could be scripted. Um, we have some customers who, and users who do that. Um, so that whenever they create a new tenant, they automatically create the tenant a router and network and add the routes. So it's just routed through. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward though. Yeah, the, I think the latest one nine and further, you can actually uh, stop running Cassandra, and it's uh, it will still work. Yeah, but those edge cases will not work where I mentioned before, or live migrate or restarting an agent for the for the NAT, stateful NAT. Yeah, but it works. This uh, this five zero quick start doesn't actually install Cassandra. Yeah, so it's a little bit lighter weight. Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, so stop by our booth if you have any questions or want to get involved. And if you want to see some cool troubleshooting tools um, uh, at the Marketplace Theater at 1245 today, we have a, a demo of some of that stuff. Uh, so I recommend checking that out as well. Thanks a lot, everyone.